Hello, I'm Father Timothy Matkin. Thank you for joining us for this study of basic Christian teaching and practice, Christianity 101. This time we're going to be talking about the sacraments. And as always, I'll read the questions and answers from the Catechism, and then we'll talk more about it. In this case, we're not going to read straight through, but we're going to pull together some different Q&As that relate to this subject and organize them in uh, basically talking about baptism and confirmation first, and then the Eucharist, and then the other sacraments together. First, what are the sacraments? The sacraments are outward and visible signs of inward and spiritual grace given by Christ as a sure and certain means by which we receive that grace. What is grace? Grace is God's favor toward us, unearned and undeserved. By grace, God forgives our sins, enlightens our minds, stirs our hearts, and strengthens our wills. What are the two great sacraments of the gospel? The two great sacraments given by Christ to his church are Holy Baptism and the Holy Eucharist. And then skipping over to the section on other sacramental rites, what other sacramental rites evolved in the church under the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Other sacramental rites which evolved in the church include confirmation, ordination, holy matrimony, reconciliation of a penitent, and unction. How do they differ from the two sacraments of the gospel? Although they are means of grace, they are not necessary for all persons in the same way that baptism and the Eucharist are. Is God's activity limited to these rites? God does not limit himself to these rites. They are patterns of countless ways by which God uses material things to reach out to us. And how are the sacraments related to our Christian hope? Sacraments sustain our present hope and anticipate its future fulfillment. And remember that as we go through this study, we're asking for God to give us the grace to know the faith, to keep the faith, and to share the faith. And now we come to the section on the sacraments, and so we will spread out that material as we mentioned before. Right now we'll have an overview of grace and sacramental theology, and then next time we'll talk about the Holy Eucharist and focus on baptism and confirmation, and we'll cover matrimony and orders and wrap up with reconciliation and unction. Most people do not realize that sacrament is a biblical word. Some say that it is something the church later invented, which we must now purge. But in fact, that is clearly not the case. Sacraments are biblical, and sacraments are gifts from God. The word comes from Ephesians 5.32. St. Paul is talking about the union of husband and wife and says, quote, This is a great mystery. The Greek is mysterion. The Latin is sacramentum. This is a great mystery, and I am applying it to Christ and the Church. The Apostle pointed to a visible, tangible reality in the world around us, marriage, and explained that it is a sign of a heavenly reality. And so the visible reveals the invisible. And he gave it the name mystery, mysterion. The Greek Orthodox, who continue to develop in the Greek language and culture of the Byzantine Empire, still call it that, the mysterion, the holy mysteries. They refer to seven holy mysteries, which are biblical ordinances that God gave us to be both signs of heavenly realities and the means of sharing divine grace. Sometimes we use that word in the Western Church as well. For example, in the post-communion prayer, in our prayer book, we thank God for that thou dost feed us in these holy mysteries. But usually we use the term sacrament, from sacramentum, which is an oath or a pledge as well as a mystery, which the old Latin Vulgate Bible used to translate the Greek word mysterion. When the word was translated, the underlying meaning is the same. The sacraments are biblical ordinances that God gave us 
to be both signs of heavenly realities and the means of sharing divine grace. They are heavenly mysteries. As we mentioned a while back, the church was born or manifested to the world on the day of Pentecost by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit ushers in a new era, the age of the church, during which Christ manifests, makes present, and communicates his work of salvation liturgically until he comes again. St. John Chrysostom said, Because the soul is interwoven with the body, the divine life is transmitted, transmitted to you in visible things. And he pointed out the holy mysteries have their source and beginning in Jesus Christ. Through the sacraments we unfold the fruits of Christ's paschal mystery. First, we are initiated into the mystical body of Christ and by the Holy Spirit through the twin sacraments of baptism and confirmation. Then that new life is nourished at God's table in the Holy Eucharist. And there are also two sacraments of vocation, the calling of marriage and of holy orders. And there are two sacraments of healing, confession, and anointing of the sick. Through these, Christ continues to minister in his church, and the Holy Spirit builds up Christ's mystical body in the world. We live in a sacramental world. We are surrounded by clues of what lies beyond. The Holy Spirit is alive and active among God's people. He imparts grace to us to help us grow holy and bring us closer to God. Being made in His image, our nature inclines us toward God. Sin would turn it the other way around, but God's grace overcomes sin and perfects nature. God is constantly active behind the scenes illuminating our minds, imparting courage, nurturing holiness, straightening our path, forgiving our sins, and healing our hearts. To understand that we live in a sacramental world is simply to say that God is active in our world. To say that God has given us seven sacramental signposts is to say that God is always active in these ways. Sacraments show us that. As the Church began to analyze the sacraments theologically, she used common philosophical norms and expressions to explain them. The philosophy of Aristotle helped the Church identify the sacraments. In that philosophy, reality comes from the marriage of matter and form. And so when pattern, or potter, comes together with matter, or mater, mama and papa give birth to reality. And so the reality of a sacrament is identified by its outward matter and form or pattern. The matter of the sacraments is the material stuff used, like water, and wine, bread, oil. The form of the sacrament or the pattern is how that stuff is used, like pouring water and saying, I baptize you. There are other sacramental characteristics we look for in sacramental theology. There must be the proper intent expressed in the rite and ritual, an expression of the desire to do what the church does, and there is an appropriate minister and an appropriate recipient. These characterize the visible sign, that which we do, but it's only a part. God is also at work. He is the invisible reality working behind the scenes. The classic definition of a sacrament comes from St. Augustine of Hippo. As the prayer book puts it so well, a sacrament is an outward visible sign of an inward spiritual grace, given by Christ as a sure and certain means by which we receive that grace. The invisible sign, or the visible sign, helps us to confirm the existence of that invisible reality. And so we know that God is work. God is at work. When we see baptism with water, in Christ's own words, we know what God is doing. He's washing away sins. But what if, for example, we used sand or oil instead of the water of baptism? Or what if we used beer and pretzels 
instead of the bread and wine at the Eucharist? Or what if the words were different than the words that Christ gave us? It could be that God is giving grace, or it might not be an occasion of grace. We would not call it a sacrament, though, because it's not that God-given signpost. If we can't be sure about the sign, then we can't be sure about the grace. A sacrament is a sure and certain means of grace. That is, a sacrament actually confers the grace it signifies. It is a means of grace. For example, washing the body with water in baptism is a sign of cleansing. The invisible reality is that the soul is cleansed from the stain of sin. This salvation process is something that is accomplished by God's unmerited favor. It is this which the New Testament gives the term charis, or grace. There's no way that any man or woman can merit or earn grace. That's not what it is. It is by nature a gift. If grace could be earned, then, as Paul says in Romans 11.6, grace would no longer be grace. It would no longer be a gift. The very nature of grace is love, and God's love is unconditional and unmerited. Grace, that word, is used in three basic senses. Salvation comes through God's grace or graciousness. Salvation is accomplished through God's gift of himself and his power. And then finally, grace or a state of grace is that status of favor with God. God saves us by his grace in the sense that God is gracious, and so he gets involved. Sanctifying grace is the gift of God that makes us holy and pleasing to him. And it leads us to that third sense, this is the grace of God in which we stand. God uses sacraments to channel his grace to us. He uses visible things to communicate his invisible presence and power. These channels of divine grace work in the Latin term ex opere operato, meaning by virtue of the work performed. That is to say that the grace is given inherently by the power of Christ. It does not depend upon the personal holiness of the minister or the recipient, because the grace we receive comes through the minister, not from the minister. Christ is always the true minister of every sacrament. The human minister stands in his place as his vessel. As the grace of God does not come from the human minister, neither does it come from us. The grace we receive comes from God. But our faith does have a role to play in making use of that grace. The fruits of a sacrament are related proportionally to our disposition in receiving it. As with any gift, the same gift may be used very wisely and fruitfully by one, and yet very foolishly squandered by another. Let's do the most with what he gives us. That's why Jesus, that's what Jesus is getting at in his parable of the good steward. He wants us to be fruitful users of his grace. So opportunity awaits. Let's use the precious sacramental gifts that we've been given, and let's never let God's treasures be unused or be wasted by us. Let them inflame the charity that God has placed in our souls, and let it burn to eternal life. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us grace to behold Thee, present in Thy word and sacraments, and to recognize thee in the lives of those around us. Stir up in us the flame of that love which burned in the heart of thy Son as he bore his passion, and let it burn in us to eternal life and to the ages of ages. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. I hope you'll stick around for more. And remember, as we go through this study, we want to know the faith, to keep the faith, and to share the faith. God bless.